good to see everyone. So I'm going to do a, a quick introduction um, just before we get started. So um, really quick, I'll introduce the Connectopreneur team who we have on here. So we have our CEO, Tian Wong. He's on the call. And we also have our new assistant community manager, Avery North. Um, she's on the call as well. She'll be taking over for me in just a couple of weeks. So I'm on maternity leave. So I'm sure you'll all get to know her really well. Um, and then last but certainly not least, I want to introduce our, our masterclass host today, which is Patrick Bryant. So he he's here with us and going to give us a great, a great class today. Um, so just a little bit about Patrick. Um, Patrick's a serial entrepreneur, a professional speaker, and the co-founder and CEO of a Charleston-based software product agency, Code and Trust. Um, after co-founding his first company, Go to Team, the largest staff video crew provider in the U.S., and taking it to 20 offices around the U.S. 25 years ago, his bio is then a steady stream of starting new businesses in media, rolling papers, and software. In total, he's launched six and counting multi-million dollar companies, some in less than two years' time. In addition, he is also... Um, had many successful startups, and Patrick serves as the director of Startup Grind DC and currently chairs for the Harbor Entrepreneur Center in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, he's recognized as a Liberty Fellow, Riley Fellow, member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network, and Entrepreneur Organization Certified Speaker. So obviously, Patrick is very impressive, and we are so lucky to hear from him today. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn the time over to Patrick. Fantastic. I am so thankful for that introduction. I have started eight companies and I love it when we are at zero. And by zero, I mean we have zero employees. <laughs> I, when we are running at that early stage and everybody's firing on all cylinders and playing, it's a lot of fun. And I, I love having companies that grow to uh, hundreds of employees like go to team, but uh, it's just not for me from a, a management perspective. I love that kernel, that energy thought process when we are, are, are pre employee. I, I joke that I have 99 employees and I, uh, excuse me, 99 problems and I can't fire them all. Uh, it, it, it is a, a tough. Um, a tough game in my mind to manage a bunch of people. And once we get to that stage that employees start asking for time off and uh, leaving work early, and uh, I want to bring my dog uh, to the office, these are things that I don't, I don't uh, manage well with because I don't I don't get into those details. What I love is the business model, the idea, the product, the service, the thing that we're going to bring to someone, how we're going to impact the world. So I like companies when we uh, get it to about 10 employees, about 10 employees, I start looking around and saying, okay, I might need to leave. And by 20 employees, you're saying, yeah, you need to leave. Uh, I, I know that moment well, and that's really how I've, I've created these companies, six of which have gone past the million dollar mark and some a lot more than that. And in each case, I've been able to run this playbook of find a product or service that is scalable, that we can move forward, and then really focus on innovation to grow it. And once it gets to that level that somebody else can run it, we write a five-year strategic plan, we've got 10 to 20 employees, that's when I get off the train and go do it again. Uh, so I, it, in creating those businesses, I then started a nonprofit in Charleston, South Carolina called the Harbor Entrepreneur Center with the intent of it helping other businesses find their moment and accelerate. That's been a fantastic time. We've helped over 100 companies in that nonprofit. So I've run a for-profit very successfully a couple of times, and I've run a nonprofit 
And it, like many of you, I have run a for-profit as a not-for-profit. That, that has happened more than once in my career. I've, I've looked around saying, okay, we are doing a really good, impactful business here, but yet I am the least paid employee. Something is, is wrong. And the truth of the matter is that statistics show 40% of businesses in the U.S., are profitable and 30 percent are floating around break even and then the other 30 percent of course are losing money and not finding scale and so that's really what i want to talk about today as we kind of set the primer of picking a business idea is either you're in that place of picking an idea or you're in a place of having a business that it's time to pivot and find some new products uh, or services. And, and, and so I want to help think through those ideas. It's just my favorite thing to, to work on. And I absolutely love it. In, let's see, over, this would have been 12 years ago now. My business partner and I were working on a cigar company. We were at a place that we were distributing cigars across the United States, mainly in Las Vegas. And we had this opportunity that we found. My business partner walks into my office and he says, we are the number one supplier of Opus X cigars in the United States. And it was mainly because of our Las Vegas accounts. This is a really high-end cigar that costs $100 a stick. And we thought, okay, if we're the number one supplier of this very high-end cigar, and from a distribution perspective, we can send cigars down our pipeline to our clients and, and kind of control what they purchase if we were to create a really expensive cigar, then we could send that down our distribution channel. Of course, it would be high margin because we control it and we could control scale because we have these clients. So it was a, a really kind of a, a perfect moment. And so we thought, all right, how can we create a really high end, expensive cigar to put alongside Opus X. And we start playing around with ideas. The first thing we did is we took cigars and we aged them in cognac. We had done bourbon age before and we thought cognac was a good idea and that could uh, be fun. And it tasted awful. It was a bad experiment. And we, we thought, okay, back to the drawing boards. So this time we take uh, our cigars, and we decide we are going to roll them in shredded $100 bills. You can buy $100 bills shredded from the mint. And so we roll them in these $100 bills, and we are thinking that this will be a cool way of burning money, and that'll be novelty and, and interesting. And it looked like a bad craft project from some preschool students. It was not impressive. And again, we were thwarted and thought, man, okay, we got to we gotta go back. But we love this idea of burning money, burning something expensive. So we thought, oh, okay, let's do melted gold. Picture a liquor bottle with the wax dripping down it. And we thought, what if we put melted gold on the outside of a cigar so it's dripping down? And we get a double boiler. My business partner calls him on the phone. He's at his house that night. He's melting gold in a double boiler. We're going to dip the cigar in it. And he says, I am uh trying to melt this gold, but it is not working. So real quick, we Google the melting point of gold and we're not going to be melting any gold in a double boiler. It is way too, way too hot. And furthermore, as we're laughing about that, we realized that had we melted gold and dipped a cigar in it, 
course, there would be no cigar left to smoke. And for as bad as we are at engineering, we were pretty good at entrepreneurship and and giving it another try. So after that laugh, we, we thought, okay, what could we do with gold? And we decided we will take 24 karat gold leaf and we'll put it on the outside of the cigar and we begin to create a a new cigar called the shine 24 karat gold cigar it's a uh, patented process that we put the gold on the cigar with a sugar base and does it come off on your hands or your teeth, uh, and you burn it. You you literally leave the gold in the ash, and it is a fantastic product that is in a ton of stores. And I want to use it as an example as we move forward to our thought processes today, which are the first thing is it is. Is something that we already had a team to execute around. We understood cigars. We had clients that were buying cigars, and we completely had the ability to create a product in the cigar space, albeit we took a lot of funny missteps along the way. On the next step, it has scale. We have sold it over the entire world, and it is sold repeatedly. Literally, people light it on fire and need to buy another one. So it is a repeatable sale to the same customer, and it can be sold the world over that scale. And finally, there was innovation. We were creating something new that no one else had thought of before. We ended up copywriting the color gold. So today, if you want to do uh, rolling papers or cigars, then you would license putting gold on them uh, through our company. And with that capability, we are able to fend off competitors. So the key things, the takeaways that I want to get into are having that ability to sell a particular product and have that team, then your scalability of that particular product or business idea, and then your innovation. Are you inventing something new that slows down all your competitors? And you certainly don't have to have all those at once, but those are the key ingredients to a fantastic business idea. I do have two sons. I have an 18-year-old and a 21-year-old, but my firstborn was a company named GoToTeam. It was mentioned in the introduction, and GoToTeam, now 25 years old, was really where I cut my teeth. We were two guys in an SBA loan, and it taught me so much. After 10 years of working on GoToTeam, we had gotten that business to a million dollars valuation. And I was really proud of that million dollars. I was super excited as a young man to have a business with a a million dollar valuation until I looked around. After 10 years, uh, Google had started the same week that we started And after 10 years, they were using the name of their company as a verb, and they were publicly traded. And so I started to ask, what allows companies to scale so quickly, and what am I missing? Uh, So in that success moment, I started trying to figure out what are the things that really drive uh, growth and high energy around a product. So I want you to picture a field, right? We have one here on screen and we've got blades of grass, we've got bushes, and we've got a really large oak tree. As we think about businesses, many, many of our businesses are blades of grass. They are small companies destined to remain small. Normally, a blade of grass does not grow into an oak tree. I don't think that's ever happened. So we need to figure out what's the difference between businesses that are blades of grass 
and businesses that are a giant oak tree. You want to be the tree. That's that's the key to our conversation today. Finding that acorn of a business idea that can grow and really uh, find scale and uh, something exciting to impact the world. So as we look here at the bottom, the key ingredients that make up that idea is to first look at understanding multiples. Some of you on the call, you already know this, you've already sold a business, you understand how to uh, uh, value a business. But for those of you that don't, let me give you a quick primer. If you take your revenue and multiply it times some multiple, then that's where you're going to end up with normal valuations. Now, there's plenty of ways to value a business, so I'm not saying that that's the only way, but it's a pretty good snapshot that you can use to value any business. You say, okay, well, the the net revenue was $100,000, and we're going to value that at 3x net revenue. That would be on the low side of a business. But a lot of those blades of grass, that's what they're selling for. They're selling for 3x that particular amount of revenue. If we were to look at a chiropractor with one firm, one office, that chiropractor is getting 3x revenue, maybe 5x revenue in a good market. Uh, So let's call it 4x, but the bottom line is that's the multiple. On the other hand, if I take that same chiropractor and I teach them to develop a piece of software, and now this software is going to impact chiropractic clients everywhere across the world, much larger impact, much larger scale. Now we're at a place that that same revenue, even if he could be two years old and just getting that software out there, but because it has the ability to scale and and is software, something that is innovative, now we've created a different multiple. And that multiple can be up to 16x. Now that same 100,000 in revenue is 1.6 million. So we just moved from a $300,000 valuation at 3x 100 to 16x at a $1.6 million valuation. We have moved from buying ourselves a, a couple of years of not working to buying a beach house, right? It's a different game. Multiple is what we are trying to drive and what we want to pay attention to. So as we look at the factors that go into that, the first one is execution. And when I think about execution for a particular team or a a brand new startup, I am really looking at what are the capabilities in the marketplace, not only in our own team, but in the marketplace in general to launch this idea. So if someone says, okay, I am already at a place that I have clients available, right? I am already selling things to this particular type of client and our team is capable of building this type of product and moving it in the marketplace, then in that way, I'm a five on the execution scale. We are absolutely capable of doing this particular idea and we already have clients in hand. On the other hand, if we are just starting out, I have occasionally people say to me, okay, so I am uh, wanting to start a restaurant. And I say, okay, well, what's your expertise in restaurants? And they say, well, nothing. I'm a school teacher. That's where you're lower on the execution scale. And my voice is, we'll go get a job in a restaurant. Like, let's get some expertise around restaurants before we try to make that leap. So expertise is key. Being able to sell to people is absolutely key. And that's where we look at the, the environment 
uh, of our execution. And yes, Craig, I saw your your piece, and that is literally what I'm saying. Your your revenue is your model, and then also your ability to grow and growth in general is uh, what driving that multiple. So you and I are, are absolutely aligned on that. So let's move to scale. Scale is looking at this idea through a lens of with this particular idea, who can I sell to and will they buy repeatedly? Because if I have the same client, of course, I can make a lot more money by not having to go find a new client every time. So a five on our scale is I can sell to every person in the entire world, toilet paper. I can sell it globally, software, and I can sell it repeatedly. Well, now they are buying it every single month, Netflix. So I am in a place that my scale is off the charts if I can do that. Now, the reality is most businesses aren't going to be able to do that. And this is where I use the example. Not every business needs to be a 555. We're not trying to hit perfection. Matter of fact, in the beginning, when we're first starting out with an idea, I really only want to hit you know, three across all the boards. Maybe even I'm a, a four or five on one and a a, a one even on innovation because I'm willing to sacrifice one area to get going. And then as I get the company moving, I'll find innovation. Or because I have an innovation, even if it's forcing me to be local and have a very small scale, that's okay with me because I'll figure out how to scale it later. So I don't want anyone to think, oh man, I did, my idea is no good because it doesn't hit all of these things Patrick wants. No, definitely not the case. In the beginning, I started with a cigar distribution company that had the ability to scale uh, and we had the team that ready to execute, but it didn't have any innovation. We found innovation in driving the product. So here we are, we got scale. That allows us to sell a ton of the product, which allows us to have incredibly uh, high economies of scale once we start creating one, especially, say, software. Once we spin it up, now we can sell it around the world for a very cheap uh, price because of its economies of scale. What we don't want in scale is a product that has a very limited audience in a small area and they purchase it once. Uh, if we were to say, hey, this is a, an elixir that is going to make you incredibly healthy, but it only needs to be taken once in your lifetime and it expires it within 30 minutes. So you have to come to our factory to buy it. Uh, and it only helps women that are six years old. We have limited so much that we've created a scenario of very, very difficult scale. And we would rather push toward the product that does those other things. Our third area uh, to think through as we're looking at our future products and how we uh, you know, are going to create something that's going to impact the world is innovation. And of course, people talk about this all the time and innovation has a ton of definitions. So I'll just give you my particular definition and, uh, and, and, and the way I look at it when I'm filtering through a particular business idea. I am looking for products and services that are protected technology, something about what we're doing, no one else can do it. And that's the beauty of, say, a copyright of a 24 karat gold cigar is few other people can come along and offer that. However, when I started GoToTeam, we had video crews and we created innovation in our hiring process 
that we put people through an apprenticeship program that was proprietary and we taught them how to run our particular way of doing video. And it became enormously successful because few other people knew how to do that process. So sometimes innovation can even happen, of course, in a, in a process, uh, not only should you think of, uh, of just an invention, uh, but it doing something different. Even your brand, if you're dealing with, say, a clothing company, your brand can be protected, of course, right? Copyrights. So sometimes a really protected brand, Lululemon, is completely capable of being innovation. Next is a five when we have a high barrier to entry. We're in a market that other people have a difficulty entering that market. Think R&D for the pharmaceutical companies. I can't just go spin up a pharmaceutical company. There are a lot of barriers to entry in R&D and in the um, all of the uh, opportunities that I, you would need to, uh, you, you know, legalize a particular pharmaceutical. Finally, a growing industry. We we know we've hit gold when we're in. A, we have an innovation that is protectable. It's in a high barrier to entry market, and that market is growing itself. Uh, medical devices come to mind. We're working on a project software-wise and medical devices right now for Blink TBI, uh, where they do this really cool uh, thing that you look into a headset and blink, and it, through AI, tests your blink rate and can tell you if you have Parkinson's, ADHD, or a concussion. It is crazy cool, and it is protected technology with a lot of patents. We're writing the software for that AI to track that. Uh, and from a high barrier to entry, you bet it's very difficult to uh, work in that particular space from a technology perspective. And medical devices in general are growing like crazy. So to me, that is one that I am just super excited about from an innovation standpoint. So those are the pieces. Those are the, the things that I look at when we are looking at a new business idea, a new business opportunity. I'm looking for that innovation, that scalability, and uh, can, whether or not this team can execute on it. And all of those are the pieces that Craig's talking about in how we come up with that multiple. We're saying, okay, you've got 100000 in revenue, but that 100000 it's not just the, uh, we're buying the revenue. We want to buy how much growth potential that 100000 has. So if you did 10000 and then 20000 30 40 50 all the way up to 100 and you were in the slow growth model of 10 years, it's very different than, okay, we did zero, then we did 50000 then we did 100 now we are projected to do 300 next year. Our growth model is completely different. We're driving that multiple. Those things are driven by, is this a product capable of scaling? Is this innovation that no one else can touch us on? Is our team capable of driving those things forward? With innovation, we are really able to have high margins. That's why we want innovation. Because if no one else can do it and we're somewhat protected, and we're laying oil slick down behind us for our future competitors, now we're at a place that we are able to charge really high margins and people don't question it because no one else is coming along to do it, right? It's difficult to accomplish. Now we're able to, to really uh, impact the world through charging these amounts. And even if they are small per item, from a scale perspective, it could be very high profits, which of course we flip back into growing more scale and more innovation. So that, that, that's my framework. That's where I come to on ideas. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to questions and people, you know, talking about your ideas. Normally when I do this in person, I go around the room and literally talk to people about what they're working on and how we can workshop it. I love 
that moment. For me, that moment of talking to people and really hearing uh, what they're working on and, and pushing it toward innovative and, and scalable is just a super blast. I believe entrepreneurship is the number one change agent in the world. It's what I get up to do in the morning. And I really love driving other people to create that impact in what they're doing. So I want you to picture a day that your business idea is completely scalable, innovative, and growing. Picture a day someone comes up to you and says, how did you come up with that amazing business idea? Picture a day you've got this business that can grow forever and use these tools to begin to push yourself toward that particular direction. You get to that place that you are able to scale and grow and make it happen. So normally at this point of the, the presentation, I, I would, uh, and I'll let Skylar give you a link. I'll, I'll put it in the, or I'll put it in the chat when we go to questions, uh, to our growth score at codeandtrust.com. We've got a growth score that uh, you can literally put in ideas and you can say, okay, here's what I'm thinking about doing. Does it have this? Does it have that? Let's talk it out. And I respond to all of those forms uh, that we get, which is a, a lot at this point, but we go through them and we look at the idea and we'll give feedback on this is where we think it's really winning. Have you thought about this or that? Uh, and, and try to help people, especially in the software spaces. That's what Code and Trust does uh, to say, okay, this is how we can drive it. So I will put the, the growth score uh, website in the um, chat in, in, um, in just a minute. So right now we're at 12.03. Skylar, I think we're on, on path, uh, on time to yeah. take a couple of questions. This is great. Yeah. So I'll start the one that we have in the chat. And um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Or if you'd prefer to unmute and ask, you can raise your hand or chime in, whatever you'd like. Um, but our first question, I think it goes back to one of your previous slides. Um, it asks, how do you know when to incentivize your current users to make additional purchases? Uh, well, I mean, obviously it depends on the product, right? Uh, I think it, uh, the answer is always uh, you want you want to be you want to be communicating with them. You want to be giving them um, the. Uh, uh, you know what? I'm sorry. Uh, my my computer just timed out. Uh, it's, Skylar, if you would type in the chat for me. Yeah. Um, codeandtrust.com slash growth score. Yep. Yeah. Growth score. Um, but, but I, I am a huge believer of incentives and uh, driving clients to repurchase. I, the idea of, of giving them that incentive is normally in line with when they need the product next, right? So in the case of a gold rolling paper, uh, you know, if they buy one, they're probably going to be coming back within two weeks, which might be different than I'm buying a set of tires and now I, I don't need to come back later, or I'm buying a, a new roof for my house, uh, which there's actually a lot of the, a lot of data around and companies actually that will go in and target specific neighborhoods for uh, roof uh, installation that is 15 years old. And they will absolutely go spend money uh, in that particular neighborhood advertising for people that need a new roof because they know that 15 year is their particular point. Uh, let me give you one other little idea that I uh, did at GoToTeam. It, we created a candy bowl that had our logo on it that, that said GoToTeam candy bowl. And for every one of our clients that booked a shoot, we sent them out this candy bowl. And so picture people that are booking video shoots, they do it every single day. And now they have our candy bowl on their desk. And every month we will send them candy if they booked a shoot. And if they don't book a shoot and a month goes by, then we don't ship them candy. 
And our entire intent, and it worked like a super champ, was they now have a candy bowl on their desk. It has our logo on us. They're thinking about us all the time. And they are getting a candy delivery if they use us. And if they don't, they're being reminded that they didn't use us and they need to book us for a shoot so that we'll get them on the candy list for that particular month. And it just really drove a lot of fun, even funny conversation where, you know, Martha would call somebody on our team and say, you know, oh, I, I need to make sure I use you guys this week because I, I want to make sure I get the candy. What is the candy this week uh, in our and for the the first couple of years, all the candy always was red, uh, which is our, our company logo. And so candy bowl, red candy, candy's missing, uh, book go-to team again. So it was a, uh, a really fun marketing um, ploy. That's, that's great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, was there anyone who wanted to unmute and ask a question? I want to let those people also have a chance. Um, I'll take one. Oh, hi, Patrick. Yeah. This is Sean McCall. I'm actually down in Charleston as well. And awesome. yeah, having spent lots of time in the DC area, moved down here five years ago and love it. Um, oh, we'll have to connect down there. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, question for you. You mentioned the roofing industry and, you know, happened to be talking to a roofer recently, a guy who owns a company. And that, that's a business where, you know, the repeat cycle is maybe every 15 years at best. Right. And what do you think about businesses like that, but as an entree into the homeowner, for instance, you sell a roof to a company, to a customer, they're probably not going to need it again for 15 years or longer, but they realize that you show up on time, do a good job, you're honest, reliable, clean up after yourselves. They now are favorably disposed towards you and would be open to things like new siding or new windows or new gutters or things like that. Absolutely. Uh, I think I think entree into the customer, you know, once you've established a customer, uh, it, like you said, you know, their their goal is tough to get them uh, and, and you you want to do everything you can to sell them additional products and opportunities. I, I would also advise the roofer if, if he were sitting in front of me, uh, what tools are you using that other roofers need? Uh, it, you know, what what are your biggest problems as a roofer? Like, let's sit down and think through what your challenges are. And if we solve those for every roofer, roofer in the United States, holy cow, like we, 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 would, we would have a huge amount of scale because of how many roofers there are. Uh, and so that's where we come into um, software, where we say, uh, it, it, you know, if, if I were to have a roofer, we, we had, I'll give you an example of Code and Trust. So we had a, a guy walk through the door at Code and Trust, who was an expert in police stations. He went around and talked to all the police stations. So just like your roofer, he had police stations. He had them as a client. They valued him. Uh, and he wanted to figure out how to provide them a product in the software space. And we helped him invent a new tool that solves a problem all police stations have around social media posting and um, people uh, getting approvals and all these kinds of things. And so we built out this piece of software for him and he immediately went and sold that software to a hundred police stations around the United States. And he had a successful software company uh, that he was no longer traveling to all these police stations, but instead running a piece of software. Uh, so I'm not suggesting every roofer is gonna find a software solution, but he very well might find a product solution or uh, something that he's doing that other people aren't doing. Uh, scaling a roofing company past um, you know, one city uh, is tough. Doing it around past the region, man, you are really starting to get into tough, tough water because of um, that whole thing we talked about. It is just really hard to scale uh, when there's low barrier to entry. A lot of people can be a roofer uh, and there's not a lot of innovation that's protecting the next guy from coming and competing with you on price. So if you can get out of that lane and find something uh, innovative that that he could either offer to every other roofer or something innovative he could offer to the homeowner uh, that could then possibly scale to to outside of his area. I like that. I like that a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And look forward to meeting you in Charleston and or DC. I'm 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 50 50. Uh, so I, I'm in both both places. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, Joe, I see your hand is raised. Did you have a question? Yeah, Patrick. 
I'm in IT for like 56 years, so emerging technologies is a focus. And looking at all the hype on certain emerging technologies like quantum and things like that, there are definitely uh, technologies that really could work and could be a stair-step approach to get where we want to go. So my question is this, when you're looking at emerging technologies, what would be your strategies to say, um, negate the, the chaff and all this stuff and all the talk and to brand a serious solution to the marketplace, whether it's domestic or global? What ways do you think would be better, especially when emerging technologies are filled with a lot of hype sometimes? Thanks. I love that question, Joe. I agree completely. I mean, there's so many fun ones right now, uh, especially I'm, one of the things I'm really focused on is AI and neural networks and machine learning. Um, and we're doing uh, a number of things in that space that are service-based for clients because we're learning what product would make sense. Uh, I, I don't always have the solution of, okay, this is the product that is scalable as innovative, but I can go offer a service in that particular arena, learn more about what our expertise is, see the problems that can be solved, and then move to a product-based business. Uh, Alan Graham said the best way to create a business is to first be an expert because if you're an expert in anything, if you're an expert in um, school teaching, then you are living in the future because you're at a place that you, you learn about things that are happening in that industry before I do. I learn about them way long after you do, right? You learn about them and then you create systems for them and all these other people start doing them. And then way down the road, my kids you know, use your process. And I go, oh, well, that's a neat process. You knew about it so far ahead. And so what he said is you got to live in the future, which means you're an expert. And by, by just by having more expertise than everyone else, you're living in the future. And as soon as you're living in the future, you just look left and look right and say, what's missing? If, if I'm an expert in self-driving cars, and we're doing all this work around self-driving cars, it is going to be very easy for me to look around and go, okay, when cars are driving themselves, what products and services will need to exist that don't exist today? Well, we would need charging stations. We would need uh, perhaps battery replacement. Uh, we would need recharging battery. Like, I, I mean, I could go on for a hundred times, right? And I'm not even an expert in self-driving cars. So I think if that's the key to me is how do we look at a particular industry and say, okay, as experts, what are, what are people going to need in the future? And if we get just far enough out into the future uh, that we can begin to offer that to them. Uh, and, and then I'll just add one other nugget to answer the question. Um, which is it, you really want to get into a minimum viable conversation with a client. That I'm coining that from my friend Mark Richards who wrote it. And it is really saying you can go out in the world and have a conversation with people that need a particular product or service and just listen. What, what's your problem? What are your, like I said to the roofer, if you're working in uh, neural networks, right now. I just want to know what are your problems? What, do you, what, do you, what would make you more efficient? Uh, what, what, what tool, if I gave it to you today, would speed you up 10x? And they, they absolutely tell us. They're like, oh, well, we have this problem and I have to download this thing. And when I download that, I connect it to this and all that. And if we just built one that did all that, man, of course, I'd just use yours. I wouldn't want to go do all that other stuff. And then that's where the product ideas come that you go, okay, got it. Now I can go build that thing. And I already know people want to use it because they're out there looking for it. They're Googling it. Excellent answer. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay. We'll go to a question in the chat that says, from the beginning of the presentation, without a large network or existing clients, what is the best way to test your product or idea in the market to see if there's value there? Now you're getting to my, my core value as an entrepreneur. Sell something to someone. 
that, that's the that's the thing I say the most to uh, nascent entrepreneurs is that you've got to just develop something that you can sell to someone and get into that minimum viable conversation. Uh, I, I also have said many times what we need to do is sell the ghost. And we do that a lot in our businesses, which is I might put together an idea, a framework of what this particular product looks like. I won't have it yet. Maybe I do the, the Photoshop screens of what the software is going to look like. And then I take it to a client. Let's say it's a manufacturing client. And I say, here are the screens of what we're building. And I'd like you to go ahead and sign up right now. I'm not, not asking you to be a beta user. I'm not asking you to give me free feedback. I'm not, all I'm asking you to do is, will you sign up today to buy this particular software when it releases in 60 days? And if they say, yes, we'll sign up for $200 a month, then I've already got a first customer and I've got 60 days to build a piece of software. Now, I am not remotely suggesting fraud, which of course is uh, a, a hard pass for me. I would never pitch something to a client that I could not deliver in 60 days. But I also won't build anything that I don't already have a conversation going with a client that's going to buy it. Because if those two don't meet, it isn't worth creating. So to me, uh, if I were to say, I don't know anything about selling chocolate chip cookies, but we think we got a really great chocolate chip cookie, the first thing I would do is go attack a market of people that I think would buy chocolate chip cookies. Uh, it, you know, it, it could be my neighbor or my school, or it could be me doing research online that I go and find a, and buy a list of people that buy chocolate chip cookies in, in uh, my area. But I would absolutely find those people and pitch them our cookies before I went to full manufacturing and I'd want them to buy them. Uh, and so people say to me, oh, but we got to do manufacturing. We got to get the packaging and we got to get the brand right. We got to do all this. Like, can you make one cookie? Yes. Well, then make that one cookie and then go sell it and say, hey, here's a cookie. It costs two bucks. Would you would you buy it? Yes. OK, great. We're then we're in we're in the game. Otherwise, we, we're not. Awesome. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and someone said, adding on to that last question, how do you know if you have successful product market fit and should continue investing and grow further? Absolutely. I, I So as I said in the beginning, I normally like that zero stage when we're at the beginning. I don't, I, I don't run with five-year strategic plans. That's normally the last thing I do when I'm with a company is write the five-year strategic plan and some other CEO is going to go go run it. And so in my case, I just say that I don't know our five-year vision. We don't even know what our product's going to look like in five years, but I know the next right thing to do, right? And the next right thing to do is normally continue to iterate on the product and sell to customers. The, the way to know that you have market fit is that someone is willing to buy it at the value that you are proposing that it is going to cost. So, if someone goes, okay, I've invented this widget for car dealers and we go to a car dealer and we give it to them for free and they give us feedback, totally useless. I don't even know why we did that. That's just a waste of time. If we go to that car dealer and we ask them to pay a dollar for it and we're ultimately going to charge $10, we're still not getting good feedback. Still a waste of time. We need to take them that widget and say, will you buy it for $10? And when they say no, why not? $10 is too expensive. Okay, we got to go back to the drawing board and figure out how to make this thing cost eight. Uh, that, that is va valuable. A no is just as valuable feedback as a yes in the early stage. As long as we understand why they said no, we can iterate on the product. We can iterate on the pricing model. We can change the packaging. We can do all these things to make them happy. So to answer the question, I am always looking for market traction. I'm always looking for people that are actual customers at the value we're hoping to sell at that are saying, I, I am 
uh, willing to buy this product. This is something useful to me. Uh, and then the more that I can increase those numbers, the more I know, okay, we got, we got traction. Uh, when we go out in the world and we say, hey, we got this widget and you know, six out of 10 people buy it, we are phenomenal. We are off to the races. Uh, if, if one out of 10 buys it, we got some work to do. If zero out of 10 buys it, we, we might want to pivot to another idea uh, or change altogether. Okay, great. Um, our next one in the chat says, founders can have an innovative, scalable business idea, but not be able to describe and pitch it convincingly. So the question, to Patrick, is do you share a framework with your founders to help them pitch? Yes, pitching is, is key. Uh, and getting that voice down, and I feel you because uh, I, I tend to, to get into these scenarios often that I am needing to pitch something new that we're working on. It might be a new business or a particular product inside of an existing business. We're, work, we're always working on some new idea, uh, or maybe we bought a company. I mean, uh, uh, in the last two years, we bought a, a big television production company. And all of a sudden, I had to go around in the world and tell people about our television production company. And uh, I didn't think they were describing it correctly. So I had to work through how, what's the cadence? What does it sound like? What are the key things that I'm trying to talk through? And as you look at that pitch, what I tend to do, even my, my talk today could have been an hour and a half. I've done full hour and a half workshops uh, on this particular topic. And the, the key to the hour and a half is an accordion mindset that is the way I look at pitches. The, the first thing I want to do is always tell a story. I want my product or my service to be connected to a particular story that drives emotion. And I want the story to tell the product, tell what the product does. And so I'm always looking for the story first, then the, the stories that path out what, what I'm trying to get across begin to, to become a framework that I can move. If you said, hey, Patrick, we need you to do this talk in 10 minutes. I would have been like, no problem, 10 minutes, I got you. I'm gonna tell the shine story, it takes four. I'm gonna tell this and that, I'm gonna blaze through the content. Uh, it's only gonna take three minutes instead of the, the 15 that I took today. Uh, so I, accordion mindset is the first thing I think of in a pitch. And I start with the long story first. So I, I'll be very verbose in the beginning. Um, Mark Twain said, you know, if I'd have more time, I'd have made it shorter. And I, I, I'll go in with, okay, I got to tell you what this company does for five minutes. And the beauty is we all have people that will listen to us. Uh, and, and, and shockingly, some of them find it interesting. <laughs> so I might call my best friend and say, hey, we just bought this business. Uh, it does this or that. And he might ask me some questions and we'll have a dialogue. And I'll be like, man, that was a cool five minutes. I just explained what that business does. And the more cadence and repetition that I tell the story and I get with working with people to uh, be able to answer that question, the more that I'm able to get that cadence down. And then I get it shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And ultimately, I can now tell that story in under 30 seconds. No problem. You're like, what is this television production company does? Oh, we own this show, this show, this show. We do all these big shows. It's really exciting. Uh, and I'll tell you a quick story about the, the guy that, you know, uh, founded the company. And, and I did it in under 30 seconds, right? So... That to me is the way I, I look at that, that pitch mindset, but it's always in a story first and then making sure I'm getting across the number one value proposition of whatever it is that we're selling. So, uh, I, you know, in the case of Shine, 
It's like you, we, we, we blew up in that first year. It would just went crazy and people love it. It's like, it's a 24 karat gold cigar. You smoke it, you leave the gold in the ash. Miley Cyrus has smoked it. Snoop Dogg smoked it on stage. It's been on TMZ three times. It's in 3000 stores, right? So stories and very fast compressed uh, story of what it is and people go oh my god that's amazing I, I, I never even knew that existed thank you Patrick that's awesome um, okay so another question from the chat says how do you suggest a service app sells its core deliverables when you have to when you have to target your audience sorry I'm reading this backward when you have to have your target audience imagine what they can do with your app because the process you offer does not exist yet selling the ghost uh the key is to paint that picture either through graphics uh and or website messaging uh telling the story of what it will do um i don't i don't tend to use language I, i'm saying to you will do but i don't tend to use the language with a client will do i always talk as if we've already built the app because in my mind we already have um and, and we're driving forward with this idea. So in present tense, I would say, this is a super exciting app. It does these amazing things that solve these problems that I know you have. Uh, and I might tell the story of, let's say you've got a problem uh, and, and that particular problem really injured you last year. And if I get the problem right, everybody in the audience is gonna be agreeing. Yep, yep, I've had that problem. Yep, I totally agree. Man, employees are a pain in the ass. Like as soon as I say that, people, yep, got it. You know, I'm I'm with you. Uh, so it, then I'd say, well, that's the problem we all have. Let me tell you how we're gonna solve it. And then I'd say, we have this piece of software, and this is what it does, and this is what it looks like, and this is what the uh, functionality is. Is that something that you'd pay for? Uh, if it, you know, if, if, if let's say. Uh, 60 days from now when we launch, uh, can I go ahead and sign you up now at a discounted rate instead of 60 bucks? It's only 4250 for you if you sign up now for a year and we'll turn it on for you in 60 days, right? Sell the ghost. Okay, great. And um, Nina, I know that you had had your hand raised a couple of times, uh, sorry, on and off. So did you have a follow-up? I do. I do. Just a really, really yeah, quick question. Course. So Patrick, if you, so here's the question. When you come out and tell that story, and the story that I tell as a female CEO doesn't land with males, doesn't land with male investors. And, and every meeting I go to will be 93% males and 7% females. And when I talk to the women, after I tell the story, women always come up to me afterwards and ask, so you left the cliffhanger, what, what happened? What was the story? And all the men just stare at me because what my business offers is typically not something that men are doing they leave it up to their wives or girlfriends or daughters so as well, a female trying to raise market, capital yeah if they're not your target market then uh, you're only pitching to them to get capital right not not as sales am i reading that right you are yes you are correct but okay. they hold the money so i have to get through to them absolutely and one the way to get through to them is to tell the stories of the women purchasing right the the, the men I, I could agree with you 100%. And, and women have a different set of um, uh, experiences, of course, especially uh, it, when it comes to running businesses. And men don't understand that. But I would say, as a man, many of us are open to the idea that we don't know that, right? And that's okay, especially as investors. Let's take women out of it. If you came to me and said, hey, Patrick, there's this problem that mechanics have. Okay, I don't. I'm, I'm not a mechanic. <laughs> I can't possibly imagine what the mechanic's problem is. Uh, but if you tell me that mechanics have this problem, and you have a solution for it as an investor, I'm way in because now you've told me, oh, there's a problem, and mechanics have it, and mechanics have paid for this solution. Let's go. Let's go do it. Is that is that helpful? Is, I feel like I nibbled around the edge there. Oops, sorry. No, that is helpful. I'm going to massage that into the beginning of my pitches now and see where I go. Thank you. Yeah, well, 100%.
Okay, perfect. Um, I know that we're about at time. So um, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to stay on for a few minutes, but it looks like we got through most of them. Um, I think, Craig, it looks like you have your hand up. So if you, it, is it a quick question or should we ask afterwards? I'll be super quick. I want to reinforce what Patrick says. One of the ways that I found that Nina can solve that problem is how many of you know women that struggle with this problem? How many of you know mechanics that might have this problem? What I have learned with investors is if they think somebody they know would use your product or service, they think it's a great idea. If they don't, they think your idea sucks. So can you ask a question on the front end to get the folks go, how many of you know someone who has a hard time with this? And it's the best tool I found to help mitigate the problem that Nina is talking about. Awesome. And I'll add to Craig too, to me, it's stories. It's always stories. It's always, the, 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 if you can paint a picture of their, their wife having this issue or their daughter having this issue, uh, then they're going to connect with it in a really easy way. Uh, and, and if you can put them in that story that is emotional and, uh, you know, the key in any story is to be ordinary enough that everybody can see themselves in it but extraordinary enough that it's interesting, right? So it's that delicate balance of always telling a story that, that people can connect and see themselves in, but also, uh, you know, extraordinary enough that they go, oh, well, you got me. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. Uh, that, that's a cool solution. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I am putting um, the link to our YouTube channel in the chat right now. So, um, this presentation will be posted on there for anyone who wants to revisit it. Um, we're, we're super grateful to have Patrick here today. What an awesome presentation and grateful for all of you and your participation. So thank you so and, much. And Skylar, joining. if I can just say, uh, yeah. Tion is one of my favorite people. Uh, <laughs> I'll support you anywhere. Tion, I, I just appreciate so much uh, what you guys have done at Connect Panur and Skylar. Uh, looking forward to uh, working with you after your leave. So yeah. excited for you. Of course. Thank you so much, Patrick, and everyone else. Thanks for being here. Bye.